equipment they use are as safe as possible is certainly our number one responsibility. We owe them nothing less. I yield back. The gentlelady uh, yields back. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Speyer, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today I rise again to speak about the horrific situation in the military, and that is the epidemic of rape and sexual assault that goes on unabated. This is the 20th time that I'm here on the floor to tell the story of yet another victim. Nineteen times before, I've been on this floor to tell about victims in military service. I've told you about the military culture that treats sexual harassment and assault with a silent acceptance, and the command structure that punishes the victim and does not take care of dealing with the perpetrator. Today, I'm going to tell you about the culture that exists in our military service academies that train our cadets to become commissioned officers. I've not told you that the same conflicted chain of command structure that exists in the military also exists at our prestigious service academies. The Military Academy at West Point and the Naval Coast Guard, Air Force, and Merchant Marine Academies follow the same rules of the military, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Today I'm going to tell you the story of Carly Marquette, who was a first-year cadet when she was raped just last year. She was a spanking brand new West Pointer. Gifted in both academics and athletics, Carly was a star high school student. She had her pick to go to any number of colleges. She chose West Point because she wanted to serve her country. West Point chose Carly because she possessed the skills and character that the Army needs for success. But only a few months at the academy, Carly was betrayed. She was raped by a West Point upperclassman that she knew and thought she could trust. He came to her room one night when she was alone to talk about girl troubles. He gave her a sports drink that had alcohol in it. Peer pressure by upperclassmen to consume alcohol is pervasive at West Point. Carly drank about one quarter of the liquid in the bottle and she became intoxicated. The upperclassmen convinced her to go to his room and he raped her. Later, the upperclassmen repeatedly went to Carly's room to prevent her from reporting the rape. She also heard about West Point upperclassmen talk about another female cadet who had reported being raped. They called the victim a slut who was asking for it. But Carly was not intimidated. She reported the crime to her chain of command. But just like so many of the stories I've told here before, no serious action was taken to assist her. West Point did not move the perpetrator from Carly's company. She had to see him every day. West Point did not alter Carly's duties, which meant that she still had to do chores with the upperclassmen who raped her. As a result of the rape and the hostile environment, Carly began to suffer post-traumatic stress symptoms, becoming depressed and suicidal. Carly resigned from West Point less than a year after becoming a cadet. It's been over a year since Carly was raped, yet the perpetrator has not been brought to justice. Why was nothing done to help this talented young woman who, only 12 months before, was deemed qualified and deserving of a spot at the prestigious United States Military Academy? The violent act committed against Carly is reprehensible. The dismissive attitude held by the Academy officials is shocking and inexcusable. It is time for this narrative to change. Last December, a Department of Defense report revealed a nearly 60% increase in reported sexual assaults at service academies, in addition to the fact that West Point was found, quote, not in compliance with the Pentagon's policies to prevent rape and sexual assault. Civilian colleges and university students can report crimes to local police officers. They can press charges directly against perpetrators, and they can obtain their own legal counsel. Military cadets must comply with the military justice system that has a horrible record of providing justice for victims of rape and sexual assault. 
Our future military leaders deserve better. Survivors can email me at stopmilitaryrape at mail.house.gov if they would like to speak out as well. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. It is my pleasure to rise today to note the third anniversary of the ending of the Civil War in Sri Lanka. On May 19, 2009, a new era, an era of peace began in this country, an era of hope an era of possibility, and an era of justice with movement towards reconnection and reconciliation. Unfortunately, implementation of this new era of hope seemed to be slow in coming and still seemed to many Tamils in the country and throughout the diaspora who have lingering fears that governance of the country will remain closed and not as democratically operated as they would like to see and that justice demands. The President of Sri Lanka started talks with the Tamil National Alliance, the party that has won all elections in the Northeast since the end of the war more than a year ago. Unfortunately, these talks seem to have bogged down and are not progressing as was anticipated. Sri Lanka is a highly centralized state. The lack of control over areas that we take for granted, such as the police, the use of land, and the education system are often cited as being one of the causes of the Civil War. It is reported that even areas not affected by the war suffer from neglect by Colombo and distant government officials who make arbitrary decisions, as is frequently noted by the World Bank and others. Tensions continue to exist between the Sinhalese, who control the government, and the Tamils, who consider the North and East as their traditional homeland. It is unfortunate that after hostilities ended on the battlefield, they still seem to exist in many of the same ways that occurred before the war actually broke out. It is my hope that Sri Lanka will be able to work through its difficulties so that this beautiful country can experience the peace and stability its citizens rightly deserve. The peace and stability its citizens rightly deserve. I thank you, Madam Speaker, and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Pursuant to Clause 12A of Rule 1, the Chair declares the House in recess until noon today. So the House returns for legislative business at uh, 12 noon.